Welcome to the Writer Dojo with your host, Steve Diamond. That's me. And Larry Korea. You should move to a small town where the rule of law still exists. You will not survive here. You are not a wolf. And this is a land of wolves now. Today's episode, Christopher Rocchio, Expose. Welcome back, everybody, to the Writer Dojo. Glad to have you all with us. All right, Larry, today, today's awesome day. Uh, one of a few episodes that we're going to record with our good friend in studio with us, Chris Rocchio. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Chris. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm uh, Christopher Ronchio. I am the author of the Sun Eater Science Fantasy series. I've got five books out now, two novellas, I think about two dozen short stories. I've been doing this uh, since 2018 when my first book came out, Empire of Silence. I was also, for seven years, junior editor at Bain Books. So, you know, worked with uh, Larry and Steve for quite some time. So, thanks for having me. 2018 was when the first really? book came That's out. Really? That's it? Mm-hmm. That's wow. crazy. That's when book one came out. My gosh. For some, I don't know. I don't know what it is. For some reason, I have it in my mind that that, that series started much longer ago. No, I sold the first one in 2016, but publishing being what it is, yeah. uh, it did sit uh, on a shelf in New York for a couple of years. So. One for a lot of our listeners, too, you're aspirational in that you have quit your day job. Uh, in, yes. Yeah, which uh, a lot of our a lot of our people are still working on that, and you try to get to that phase. And uh, we'll I'm talk about your we'll talk that. about your career path and uh, yeah. Steve right now is on an involuntary hiatus from regular That's jobs. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, you live the dream for a little bit. I'm, I'm, the, the, I'm, the 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 existential dread is part of it. That's so, right. Yeah, I'm no, still there. Just, I'm, yeah. I'm not dead yet, guys. Well, all right. So so we thought. We thought for all of our listeners out there, part of part of what's cool about the Writer Dojo is is yes, we 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 talk about a lot of writing concepts. We talk about different genres. We talk about um, tips and tricks of, of ver- from various angles. And so, but you know, when we had say Craig Nibo on or Dave Butler on, um, or when we were down at FenCon and we had guys like Chuck and. Um, Dave Carrico and, and Tony and Tony Weisskopf and uh, oh and we had Rob Hampson on Rob Hampson Chuck and, Gannon yeah so when we had all those people on it's to me anyway and I don't know how you feel Larry but I feel it's really important for for our listeners and for for readers to actually kind of get to know the authors a little bit because it's really easy to like pick up a book read it and have it feel just kind of this I don't know this this soulless disconnection from the person who actually poured their their heart and soul into this into this thing. Now, when when Chris pours his heart and soul into things, there's much more heart and soul that goes into it because his books are freaking way longer than ours. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm like I'm like, you know what? Give me 70, 80k, and I feel good. Yeah, you. Chris uh... is like. Chris is like, that's chump change. Yeah, we're floating around the quarter million range, sure. Yeah, you, um, you put out some pretty epic books. My largest are 200K, and I've only got a couple of that are that are in the 200K range, and you put up 250s. Yeah, well, it's because I'm dumb, right? Because they <laughs> you know they pay you about the same for a book that's this long, and I could have written like 12 books by now instead of you know five. Uh, so you know I should be smarter. I should write shorter books, but at this point, you know, sort of baked into the series. If I if I turned into book seven at half weight, um, my readers would murder me. So you know, I actually talked with Brandon Sanderson about that. Um, oh gosh, when was this? It was right around when the first Dune movie came out. He was talking about that, and he's like, you know, eh, yeah, yeah, I could probably turn in two books that are half the length of these ginormous stormlight books that I'm doing. He said, but at this point it's almost an expectation for me now. So, but you know, that dude's a machine also. Well, he's also got, he, he there's, there's sort of a, a genre and brand expectations on size. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I guess you kind of like figure out where your comfy zone is as a writer, whether you're on the long side or the short side of what your genre specifications are. You're apparently on the long side. Sure. Yeah. Um, do you do you have do you have contractual word limits in your in your contract? Uh, minimums usually. Yeah. Um, there, Is it the normal like one twenties? Yeah, that or like one hundred even. Yeah. Um, it was weird starting out. Um, so I sold Empire of Silence. It was half as long. Uh, it was about really? one hundred and thirty thousand words. Yeah, and then my my first editor, a lady named Sarah Guan, Sarah said, "Christopher, I love the book. This is amazing. I want you to change like these two things." And they were like very basic, world building things. 
And I was like, if I do that, I have to rewrite the book. She's like, it's fine. You have like three months. So like, just go for it. <laughs> so uh, for those three months, I like did not speak to anybody. Uh, I, like, I, except when I was waiting tables, I was, you know, still doing that. And um, uh, I just like knuckled in and, and did everything I could. I basically rewrote everything in the first book after Hadrian leaves home. Right. Uh, you know, and all that was new. Uh, and it's like three years newer than the first part of the book. So there's like, for me, rereading, I'm like, ooh, those first 20 chapters, like, ah, man, you know, um, there's a little bit of a difference there that I, most people can't recognize, but like I see it. Uh, but then I took the opportunity and added in a bunch of stuff that like didn't make it into the original version of the book because they told me, you know, uh, your book needs to be around 120,000 words or your agent would your agents won't look at them. Uh, they don't want to see, you know, quarter million word books from first time writers in traditional publishing because they're more expensive to print, yes, right? And bookstores order fewer of them because they take up more physical space in the store, right? And if, you know, your books maybe got a, you know, three inch spine, they're going to order one, maybe two. If it's much smaller than that, it might order five or six and you can get to more readers. So like the, like the, the financial incentives, uh, for debut writers, um, tend towards writing shorter novels. And I, I walked into a bit of a landmine with this. Uh, you know, famously, my first book is unfindable in hardcover now. And this is a, like, I get emails about this like three, four times a week. Books one through three are unfindable now. That is true. Yeah, it's gotten worse. Uh, and they won't reprint them because it's just expensive to do, especially now, right? The price of paper is through the roof. So there are like all these little like, you know, back at the shop problems uh but they uh but i but i did i snuck in a whole bunch of extra stuff i basically completely transformed the book from the book that i sold them um i think it's much better this way it's a great book but uh yeah on that note it's actually guys for out there our audience if you have not checked this out um it's fantastic and we're going to talk a lot about more about some of the stuff that uh chris does specifically as a writer his his, his, his your toolbox you know that you work with you do some stuff that's really impressive. And the way, the way I've pitched this book to people, the way I've described this book to people, is imagine Dune, but Roman, and written better. <laughs> and that's, yeah. not the bag, that's not the bag on Frank Herbert, it's not the bag on Dune, but it's a product of a different era. Yeah, I, 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 you and I were talking about this the other day, Larry, and, and that's that I, I think what it is, is when you read Frank Herbert's Dune, and well, especially those first three, right? Dune, Dune Messiah, and Children of Dune. They're, they, they are, it's like you said, they're very much a product of, of a time period. And, and the way that people wrote then is different than the way people write now. And, and so again, yeah, that, that this isn't to, to, to put down Frank Herbert at all. I, I love, I well, love sure. Frank like, Herbert. I love those first three Dune books. He writes in uh, like third omniscient, right? So right? He's constantly moving from people's heads, you know, back and forth. And for a lot um, of people, that's super jarring. It's it's hard for, especially I think modern readers to get used to that because mm -hmm. like nobody, nobody does that anymore. I think in Dune, it's super effective, but I, I found, you know, uh, watching, talking to readers, you know, online or whatever, and they haven't read Dune before because I, I run into people who've read my books first, which is very weird for me, right? And like, mm -hmm. oh, like well, I heard you like deeply inspired by Dune, like absolutely, and like I haven't read it. And like you should, uh, and they'll come back and be like, "I like yours better because like this whole writing thing is uh, like kind of jarring. It's a little different." Um, well, because you write in first person, right? Right, which is like the single point opposite. of view. Yeah, four millions of words, which um, is crazy. And we're going to talk about that on a future episode that we're going to do with you. But I, I, you guys need to understand, that's a lot of freaking words from a single. <laughs> point of view perspective <laughs> the thing is though the books are very long but they're not dull they're they're really good and yeah, the pacing is really the pacing's good. tight uh the story's tight the world building's tight and they're just interesting like you got strong characters uh so i i, I wholeheartedly endorse i think I, I think i've covered blurbed you before uh actually i don't know if, the, if your other publisher wanted my name on probably not so they have I'm, not run it uh, okay but i think it's going on book six finally <laughs> okay cool <laughs> Cool, good. Well, let's talk about that really quick. Yeah, let's okay. talk about let's your talk career about, path let's here. Let's talk about, you know, you starting out, you know, throwing your book around, um, you know, you working at Bain, sure. but your book not being picked up by them immediately and then going to Daw instead. So let's, let's talk a little bit about some of that. Stuff. Yeah, so in a lot of ways, I think I have like the classic becoming an author story, right? I, I didn't do the thing where you like go around conventions and like meet people and sort of, you know, sidle in. Uh, I was uh, in college, went to North Carolina State for English because I'm a fool. 
uh, you know, I hate money. Uh, and, um, and so, <laughs> uh, so I was doing that and about halfway through college, I'm like, oh, I'm running out of time. I'm going to be an actual adult soon. Right. I need to like actually write this allegedly you know, darn book. And, um, yeah, allegedly. And, uh, so I sort of cleared the deck and I started over, uh, you know, I, and this is when I actually changed. The book was written in third person originally. And I'm like, I need to do something different. Really? I need to kind of like think about the project from a new angle. Why don't I change the point of view? Let's do first person. Uh, it had like multiple points of view originally and it just, it wasn't, it wasn't working. Uh, so I need to do something new. I changed that. I changed a lot of arbitrary stuff just to make it feel like it was a new project. I changed a lot of place names, uh, and things like that, just so that I was, I was ready to go. And, uh, that last year in college, um, I started my internship at Bain. Uh, there's an internship program at uh, NC State where they placed English people with like real companies and I was going to work with a small press remotely and they told me you know there's like a real publisher like 30 minutes up the road and I had no clue like why is there a New York publisher in Wake Forest North Carolina that's what uh and their science fiction what uh completely insane so uh that was sort of a happy accident but uh, I was also working on uh, the final draft of uh what would become Empire of Silence uh and I was looking for uh for agents and I did this the traditional way. I uh, I had uh, uh, the CIFWA directory from my internship at Bain. So this is like the one real bit of cheating that I did was I didn't have to Google all of these people. I just had the emails. And I rotated through like a batch of, you know, five, ten at a time. And I tweaked my pitch, you know, every time they came back, no. I think I ended up getting rejected 50, 52 times, 51 times, something like that. That's pretty good. That's uh, good. Which is, yeah, you know, it, I've, I've heard much higher. But I've, yeah. I've also heard much lower. I have a friend who got a uh, full manuscript request on his first attempt. I hate that guy. Wow. Man. Uh, yeah. Screw that guy. Yeah. I was about 100-ish. Yeah. Yeah. Laurel uh, Hamilton was 250. Oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is a lot. And she's I, made more money than all of us put together. Sure. I got a I got a text from Larry once, and he said, hey, Steve, want to co-write this book with Bain? I said, sure. <laughs> so I was in. That was how it worked for me. Yeah. No, that's, uh, that's the easy way, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, lucky for you, I was lazy and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it all comes together. Uh, but, um, but yeah, so eventually uh, I, I got uh, a, a hit from an agent, uh, Shauna McCarthy, uh, who represented uh, Eric Flint. Uh, and uh, she liked the book and she took me on right uh, about a month before I graduated in December. And she's like, look, publishing shuts down in about three days for the holidays. It won't be back until after the new year. So, like, do some edits. She gave me some notes. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get to this after the new year. About two weeks after the new year, uh, I'd had like seven publishers who were interested. Um, and the reason that I ended up with DAW uh, is sort of twofold. One, I didn't know that Bain was going to hire me. Uh, I'd stuck around after the inter internship, did some temp work. Because uh, I could kind of tell maybe a couple of the employees were on their way out the door. And like maybe, maybe it would work out. But uh, I didn't know for sure that was going to happen. And then DAW came forward on like a Monday uh, and, and with an offer, they wanted to buy four books, hardcover, pretty good amount of money. Uh, Bain was looking at the book at the time, but I, um, you know, I, I felt kind of uncomfortable about being like the intern who was like, would you please look at my book? Cause that was every intern after me. And it was always kind of a bad look. So I didn't do that. Uh, and I just had my agent send it like a normal person, uh, would. And, um, so Bain was a little bit late getting back. Daw had a really good deal. I took it, and like three days later, Bain uh, offered me the job. And I was like, look, this just happened on Monday. Uh, is this going to be a problem? And Tony's like, that's awesome, but also we hate you. Uh, so um, <laughs> she was very cool about it, uh, still is. And, um, you know, I did five books with Daw. Daw got bought by some new corporate overlords in the last year. Completely changed their sort of tune toward me. They went from being very excited, like, you know, you have two more books. It's great. You know, uh, we're going to get you a new editor for the next series, right? Betsy Wilhelm was talking about taking me on. And just like overnight, it went from that to you get one more book. And then if you want to write more with us, you can apply like anybody else. And that was uh, quite a tone change. And, you know, I, um, you know, I'm not blaming like Betsy Wilhelm or anything for that. You know, the corporate stuff is weird and gross sometimes but uh i called tony and said look like i thought i had two more books do you want them and she said yes so uh, back home now uh book six probably be done tomorrow i'm writing the last chapter now uh you know took a break to come up here so wow we're uh, we're almost there so that's awesome yeah uh and it is really long it's like three hundred thousand words long so you're kidding me. it's so it's so long uh it's not it's not the plan 
uh, but you know, there's editing, you know, and uh, you know, maybe we can get it back towards a reasonable, a reasonable size. But, yeah, you uh, know, just down to like two ninety or something. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, I don't think we publish uh, encyclopedias. I mean, that's kind of like pushing it there with the. Yeah, those do, are, does, does the binder go that big? These are like these are like Weber sized books. Yeah. You know? Oh man. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, not 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 the plan. Uh, I outlined this one shorter, and it just said no, uh, which is not uh, not very fun when books do that. But uh, I'm actually really excited. I'm really excited to have you back at Band, and I'm I'm really excited to see how they do. Yeah, me too. Uh, I'm feeling pretty good about it. You know, the books have uh, built a you know a tidy tidy little audience. Uh, you know, so I'm hoping you know this, this is a good time to make a jump like this. So we'll see. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about like your writing process. So we'll be right back. Hello, word mercenaries. I'm Thomas Umstadt Jr., host of the Novel Marketing Podcast, here to bring you Book Marketing Commandment number four, Thou shalt measure thy marketing. The publishing world is polluted with book marketing superstitions. Compounding the problem is a fog of variation. Every book author and audience is different. That hot new marketing tactic someone shared in a Facebook group may be a superstition. It may be a valid tactic that won't work for you, or it could be just what you need to supercharge your book sales. So how do you know what works and what doesn't? Data, data is the light that shines through the fog to reveal the nonsense from the knowledge. Next time someone shares a hot new tactic in a Facebook group, ask, for their numbers. If they don't have numbers, suspect nonsense. To learn more about how to use data to hone your book promotion, check out my website, authormedia.com, or listen to the Novel Marketing Podcast. All right, welcome back. All right, Chris, so I think what we want to do for the back half of this episode, uh, you know, I, I feel like our listeners got to know you a little bit, and that's cool, but one of the one of the the coolest things that we like about bringing guests on is having the having the listeners kind of hear some of these some of these techniques and stuff that, that Larry and I always talk about, but hearing from a different from a different perspective, from a different angle. Because it might be that, you know, the way Larry and I say something, it it might hit for, for some of our listeners, but for others, they're just like what the crap are you guys talking about? You guys make no sense. You guys spend half your days hacking up a lung and, you know, the rest of them trying not to swear. So, you know, uh, but if you handle some of these things and you tackle some of these topics um, and you talk about the way you do things, it might resonate differently for some of our listeners. Now, at the very top of this episode, Larry and I kind of briefly mentioned how uh, how we're both huge fans of yours. We both really, really love and respect the way that that you're able to to write. Um, and for us, it really seems like I and, and I don't know if this is a conscious thing you do, or if it's just if it's just you know you know natural Michael Jordan level talent or something. <laughs> sure, crap, sure. You know that uh, it feels like when we're reading your stuff. There's, I don't know, I, I don't know if it's the way that you phrase things, if it's the way you structure your sentences to paragraphs, to pages, to the, chapters. The, the, I always, I always sort of refer to it as prose. You yeah. know, it's like what you, how, what your prose style is, or, or I refer to it as like wordsmithing. It's just like yeah. your your ability to paint a picture with language. Sure, you are more gifted at that than almost anybody I know. Well, thanks, Larry. That means a lot uh, coming I, from you, especially. I mean, I know we, uh, me and Steve, know one guy who is the most gifted prose writer alive, but he just doesn't write books. Yeah. That's Pat Tracy. Yeah, he just doesn't write. But he's an award-winning poet, so when he writes fiction, literally everything he does is poetry. But it's yeah. it's amazing. But you, I mean, you can keep that up. Like like honestly, when you go through Sun Eater, it's like every paragraph has weight, and you do this for two hundred thousand some odd words. Yeah, you know, I, I, you know, every now and then, every now and then, I have a moment where I'm like, yeah, that was, a, I, I did good that time. I better not do too many of those or I'll use up my quota for the rest of the year. Well, critics refer to me as they, they say that Larry Korea has workmanlike prose. 
Which I'm okay with that. I mean, because hey, that's whatever. just that's my that's how I tell right. stories. Right. Being a workman is cool, right? Yeah, I mean, I work for a living, but like, but so so, do you come at that consciously? Is that something you strive to do, or do you? Is it just is that your just natural style? No, that that's to, well, it's a bit of both, right? Like you do something consciously long enough, and you get unconscious about it, right? But um, it's weird you mentioned poetry because um, uh, I I have a rhetoric degree. Uh, which, like, who has a rhetoric degree, and why would you have one? Uh, I uh, I thought I was going to be a technical writer, and that's sort of like where you where you go into. Fortunately, uh, that did not happen because the technical writing classes I took were terrible, and I hated it. Uh, but like, we used to teach rhetoric. It was one of the like three fundamental uh, subjects in a classical education, like throughout the medieval period and up until early modern times when we uh, you know abandoned teaching it for some reason. Uh, which is which is weird because like how to speak and how to structure your thoughts is super important. Like no wonder it's a fundamental subject for 2000 years. Um, and now, you know, people can't even, you know, speak. So, uh, it, it, it's interesting how and we can uh, how that tweet happens. and watch TikTok. Right. <laughs> it, exactly. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so this is, uh, you know, this is something that, that like means a lot to me. Now, obviously when I'm speaking extemporaneously, not nearly, you know, uh, not nearly the same, but, um, there are lots of like sort of canonical ways that you can structure a sentence for like, like differential impact right and this is something that like, nobody teaches anymore uh there are things like like uh like tricolon right is when you have a set of three things right you know um you know you've got like um you know his heart his uh his eyes his soul whatever right you have this set of three and the fact that it's three like three is just a number that sort of feels good to people you know it sounds good to them and you got things too where like you got the famous you know jfk quote where he you know reverses word order and things like that ask not what your country can do for you ask what you can do for your country things like that just sort of hit people People kind of where they live it's almost like a genetic thing even um, and we don't really do that anymore and so um, this was sort of what my, my basic training was uh, in university so I managed to get like the one job where it's useful uh, you know uh, in, a, in a modern context right um, I you know decided speech writer basically and um, you know uh, so th so that helps but um, uh, good prose sounds good uh, I was a big audiobook kid growing up. I had the the Lord of the Rings unabridged CDs, uh, and I they were the only audiobooks I owned, so I listened to them religiously. I, I would finish them and I would start over. So I've probably listened to the Lord of the Rings a hundred times, and like that's not a that's not an exaggeration. And Tolkien had um, has a very good style. It was a very antiquated style. Even in his own time, he was writing more like late Victorian style prose than 1950s. Right? You read like a pop fiction writer from like the 1950s it does not feel like Tolkien. And Tolkien was actually kind of pilloried for his writing style at the time. He's like, this is so old fashioned. Ugh, jokes on you, right? Like nobody reads anyone else from that period anymore, basically. Um, and um, and so I learned that like writing needs to sound good. And so uh, I kind of talk to myself all the time when I'm writing. I, I, I read every sentence as I'm writing it kind of under my breath. Uh, you know, my wife's like, can I come hang out with you when you're working? Like, no, actually, like it's <laughs> embarrassing, uh, you know, and you will make fun of me and it will completely ruin the process, uh, you know. So um, there's a lot of sort of sub-vocalizing. There's a lot of like reading over stuff, especially dialogue, right? Because you want your dialogue to sound like something a human being would say. Yeah, we've talked about that. I, I read all my dialogue out loud as I as I do it as well. Yeah. As I edit too. Yeah. It, as you edit is like hugely important, right? Because you've totally like missed words. Like there's a the missing in your sentence somewhere. And that's the best way to catch that stuff. But uh, it's also a really good way to like... Um, you know, catch for impact. So uh, as I'm writing, I'll, I'll sort of speak through everything and make sure, like, it, almost like it's a speech, right? And I'm writing in first person, so it kind of is, kind of like the whole books are, all the book is, is a monologue. Uh, and so you can imagine, you know, your character is sort of sitting there trying to tell, you know, the story to an audience, right? And um, and when you sort of think about it that way, in the, especially with first person, but this is true kind of generally, um, and you pause, you know, the way you think your character would pause, your prose kind of naturally will fall into this sort of rhythm and you can wring a lot of emotion out of that because you were feeling the emotions as the writer anyway, right? And if you kind of get out of your own way and let that stuff happen kind of naturally by using other parts of your brain and other senses, right? Listening to your prose, uh, for example, right? Your ears are a different part of your brain, right? Or attached to a different part of your brain. And uh, sometimes that part of your brain is smarter than the part that's doing the writing, right? Mm -hmm. And you kind of need to work together. Um, and um, especially when you're when you're revising, um, you know, you want to read it like you're reading it to someone. If you have to read it to somebody to get there, uh, all the better. Because if you're reading it to yourself, sometimes you start to cheat and you kind of mumble and you skim. 
Um, do you go back and listen to your audiobooks? Uh, yes, it is uh, very hard to do uh, at any length. This is partly why I owed uh, I owed Steve some revisions uh, on on the first book for something we're working on, and um, it uh, took me a little while because it's kind of painful for me to listen to. I'm not Kanye West. I do not like to listen to my own music. Uh, <laughs> you know, it is uh, it is difficult. So um, you know, because there's always something you think you can do better, right? Uh, you know, even when the book is done, I remember I had the first book come out and uh, I started listening to the audiobook because so this is going to be cool, right? And I get to like the first line of dialogue in the audiobook and it's missing a word. And No way. Oh yeah, the word in is missing in the first line of dialogue. And um, I fixed it. It's fixed in the ebook. It's fixed in the mass market, but the hardcover and the audiobook are wrong. Uh, and, uh, and they're just objectively wrong. There's a word missing. Uh, it's not like a taste thing. And so I learned my lesson, and I do not listen to my audiobooks all the way through unless Steve makes me. Uh, but I do um, my best. But you know, uh, <laughs> but 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 this is uh, I, I think this is like a pretty easy thing that like a lot of people don't think to do is, is sort of sit down and, and, and do that. But if you want to too to like look at some of the rhetoric stuff, there's a really uh, good resource actually. Uh, BYU's website has uh, it's called Silva Rhetorici. Uh, huh. S i l v a r h e t o r i c AE. Um, I can't spell uh, at speed. I was not a spelling bee guy. Uh, but uh, typing fine. Uh, but it uh, has like a catalog of all these old rhetorical structures I was talking about, like tricolon and stuff. And That's so what I had to do when I was in school, and this is what they used to make like 12 year olds, this is what made baby Shakespeare do, uh, is look at these devices and like write examples of them, like generate a sentence that uses this structure. Uh, you know, and um, how much better would in, kind of like high school English education be if we actually did useful stuff like that? Yeah, we don't teach people how to write. No, we um, high school. Don't, that's a subject I could get spun up. That's a whole other several episodes well, of oh, me, me too. Ranting. Well, yeah. and then you you and I went to school for business and accounting. Yeah, and so they they don't teach us English in those classes. Well, in high school, I went to Junior Gladiatorial Academy for gifted drive by shooters. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, I <laughs> yeah, really was, I really lost out in high yeah, school English. I well, mean, no, they tell you these days in English classes that you know it's a it's a it's a lesson in how to learn. No, it's not actually right. It's to teach you how to speak. It's to teach you how to. Speak think clearly how to write and to connect you to a tradition and a culture um you know which should be your tradition and your culture right and we don't we don't do that anymore people like they're like why do i need to read shakespeare what does it have to do with me uh, a lot actually right one these stories are actually really good and you should you should like be familiar with them but like they mattered to your grandparents they mattered to your great-grandparents and they should matter to you they're for like this reason five or six hundred common words and phrases right well yeah, yeah come from there but also there's like witches and murder and you should read them right you should like watch them they're important uh see this will get me spun up too uh and um and like if you like actually engaged with them and taught them properly people would be you know they, they, they would be less dumb uh you know uh <laughs> so um anyway uh Setting that aside, right, like, but, but if you want to be a writer, right, like, these things are useful to, like, practice because um, these are techniques in writing um, that kind of just naturally, at least in English, sound good to people. In different languages, there are different techniques and things. Famously, like, Greek poetry is, like, a completely different rhythm than English poetry, and you can't adapt that. Well, um, it's interesting, too, because, like, it doesn't even have to be stuff that necessarily fits... Like uh, what you do, well, well, a great example of that is H.P. Lovecraft actually recommended people study the King James Version of the Bible for writing. Sure. Oh, it's beautiful. Wait, we, but, but it's not Lovecraft, but if you look at the way he, like, he will turn a phrase, um, you know, and that's what he recommended, you know. And so it's interesting that you come from that, uh, that angle because then you take this classical education stuff and you apply it to basically this big action science fantasy series. And it's uh, it's amazing. Like honestly, it, it's it your writing can be very poignant at times, uh, and it's got a lot of weight and depth to it. So yeah, these are big books, but and I don't want to I don't want to like give people the impression that these are like weighty tomes of academic you know boredom. No, they're not. They're they're very accessible and they're very enjoyable. Uh, I I think the thing that I I noticed when I when I read Empire of Silence was just how fast paced it was and and it's not because it's not because it's doing the things like like it's not doing the james patterson thing right where, where the chapter is 15 15 and a half words right yeah and chapter like, one chapter one is takes is up like, one page yeah it's ridiculous, there's a blank right? page and then there's like three paragraphs and then it's chapter two is another page <laughs> or or a lot of the things 
when I write a lot of first person stuff, which which is my preferred tense as well. But you know, I I'm always thinking about like you know this next big set piece, this next big action scene, because I I love writing those. And yet, when I was reading Empire of Silence, are there were there were long stretches where there wasn't any call it big set piece action and yet it was engrossing well, the whole time you're drawn along by the world building and the character yes. stuff like the beginning of the the beginning of your first book you've actually got a big long swath at the beginning about this guy's youth and the relationship between him and his brother yeah. and then stuff like the, like the little love interest but the fact is this guy's royalty and she's not and like the, the way you wrote that so there's a lot of there's a lot of weight to this guys but it's very enjoyable it's very approachable so highly recommended i'm curious chris when when you first envisioned all of this to you did the did the universe come first or did the characters come first yeah so i've been trying to write something since i was about 8 uh and uh, at the time it was epic fantasy it was completely unrecognizable and i never like stopped working on that project um so I, I have a really hard time answering this question because it wasn't the same project when i started at all like there were no pieces that were the same and it slowly transformed and became a space opera at some point uh and i don't know when that was even right it's hard to sort of you know pinpoint it because it's really a it's it's like a ship of theseus problem uh and, and so i think uh, probably what was first was a character. That character became Hadrian, but he kind of probably was like eight, nine. I started out, it was probably just Batman, right? It might just have been Batman. I can't remember. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, like maybe he had a sword, but he was Batman, basically. Hey, uh, man, Batman was Zorro, so it all comes from somewhere. Right, we, we, we were full circle. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and so I don't really know. I think, I think it was probably the character. Um, I find when I'm like doing short stories, it could be kind of anything, right? And it kind of depends on the project. Some of the short stories, like I will have a prompt because I did all these themed anthologies when I edited it at Bain, right? It would be like, oh, we need to do courtroom stories. I'm like, oh, I would never have done that in a vacuum. Okay, what do we do with that? Um, but some of the other ones, I'm like, oh, I really need to like write another Hadrian story because this little ebook collection I'm putting together doesn't have one. So, you know, we'll start there. And um, so it could be anything. I think with this series, it was probably a character. It just wasn't Hadrian yet. He turned into Hadrian, I think, sometime in high school. So it's uh, hard to say. Evolutionary brainstorming. We just had an uh, episode yeah. about brainstorming, and it's, uh, this is definitely the evolutionary version of it, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's it's been very gradual. Uh, it's hard to say when the first chicken or the first egg was. I, I, yeah, exactly. Now, you, you, you've you kind of developed this reputation for... Uh, every anthology that you put a short story in for, you connect it to your Sun Eater world, universe, whatever you want to call it. We Somehow. Did, did for me with the Noir anthology. Gutter, yeah. uh, gutter, gutter Ballet? Gutter Ballet. Gutter yeah. Ballet. That's yeah, you managed to do like a basically a hard-boiled detective story in this setting. Yeah, it was a really big setting, so I can basically, basically do anything. Although, Jason, I did have to say no for the first time. Jason Cordova asked me to do one, uh, and the, he was like, it has to relate to this piece of art. and had like U.S. soldiers in it. I'm like, I can't. They don't exist anymore. It's too far in the future. So I was like, Jason, I got to keep my reputation pristine. I got to say no. Uh, he was like, you could just do it about the alien. And I'm like, I, that's not the prompt, though. You're asking me to cheat. <laughs> um, so, uh, so he finally, you know, kind of defeated me, but I won by Fabian tactics, right? I retreated and I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, Hannibal can't get me over here. So um, <laughs> do you approach, you, you, you know, we just talked about kind of your approach at writing um, and the structural aspects of it. Do do you employ any different tactics when you're writing short fiction versus long fiction? Um, not particularly. I outline everything. Um, it's you just outline a, your short stories. I, too. I outline my short stories. Um, they're oh. just much shorter outlines. Uh, and it might be like two pages, right? As opposed to like the books can be like seventy pages. Uh, they're really long. But I think about my outlines as sort of low resolution drafts. Uh, more than they are really outlines because I, I almost never look at them again either I'll, like i'll refresh my memory I'm like what is chapter 37 right okay this is what i'm writing all right i don't really need to look at it again switch off the targeting computer um but by going through the outline and being really thorough in the outline phase i get a lot of what i think the writer's block stuff uh could be out of the way um because i think a lot of writer's block is just like a failure to plan i think that more people are probably planners than like 
they know or want to admit. Uh, like, obviously, some people can just do whatever they want, and that's fine. I'm not one of those people, and I, you know, I'm not saying that you aren't, but it may be that if you're having trouble, if you're getting writer's block, you might secretly be an outliner, and you haven't, like, explored yeah. that about yourself. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so I, so my first book wasn't outlined. Um, Empire of Silence, I had, like, theoretically infinite time until I was getting towards the end of college to work on. Uh, but, you know, the thing about being a professional uh, author is they expect you to, like, turn stuff in. You oh, know, weird. like regularly. Yeah, it's weird. crazy how that happens. It's super weird. Uh, very rude too. But um, you know, <laughs> it's uh, great when the the cover of the book is out and marketing materials and stuff, and you haven't finished it yet. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I've been there once. Um, oh, I'm there right now. Yeah, I'm say, there you're, today. Uh oh, all right. <laughs> you're living that one. Uh, we're getting close for me because I, I know they're working on that cover for book six now. Uh, same so, artist, right? Oh yeah, yeah. We're keeping we're keeping the same look. Okay. That was uh, that was a really big deal to me because uh, everybody loves those Kieran Yanner covers. They're really good. So I was like Tony, really I don't cool. want to keep them. But um, yeah, no. Um, but yeah, no. So like the outlining is is super important. Uh, also, I'll write the outline, you know, 50, 60 pages. And having done that, I know what chapter thirty seven is, you know, because I've I've written about it in like half a page of space. And the cool thing about that is if it doesn't work. Throwing out half a page of chapter outline is like way less painful than throwing out 20 pages of chapter. And so it actually saves me a lot of heartache, I think, over the course of these, you know, very long development process. Because this book, I think I've been working on for 10 months, which is pushing too long. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm ready to move on. Well, there you go. Time for one last question. I am just curious about this. And if you can't answer, I understand. Uh, so if you're, you're finishing up the series, this is your big pivotal flagship series. Do you know what you're doing next? I've got a few ideas. Um... Uh, the one that I've mentioned a few times is I would like to do sort of a sort of a Jack Vance sort of planet kind of thing. Um, so uh, there is an old interview with Larry Niven in which he talks about because uh, I was like super into Halo uh, when that, oh, yeah. when that came out like everybody was right uh, and uh, and I was the right age for it too so I was all over that. Um, I really liked the big superstructures, and so you know, went to read Ring World, and there was this uh, old interview with Larry Niven who talks about this like gothic sort of adventure series that could be set on an Alderson disc because the sun would never really set, and it would be kind of you know um, spooky and sad, and that would be cool. And then like it never, it never came to be. So uh, I kind of want to do this like distant future sword and planet kind of. Like I say, Jack Vance, Fritz Leiber kind of thing. I think it'd be fun. Cool. Um, I don't know if that will be the next thing. I might do a couple standalone novels before I do another series. But uh, I've been kicking that idea around for a couple of years now and it won't leave. So. Um, oh, that's a good indication when you got one of those, those like brain worm ideas, yeah, you're yeah. going to have to write it eventually. It's, yeah. That's just how it is. Yeah. So it'll show up someday. It might not be, you know, book eight, but it'll, 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 it'll be soon. Yeah, so I, I've, I've been that way with a few things where I've had, like, nagging background ideas that I had to get to. Like, like before I did Son of the Black Sword, I did Hard Magic, but I, but for forever I just had, like, I needed to do an epic fantasy. You know, having done urban fantasy, I needed to do that. And once you get that little, it's like, it's like when, you're, when you're eating corn and you get the little sliver in your teeth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And you just keep bugging it with your tongue. That's how it, how brighter brain is. So hundred yeah. percent. Um, I've got a lot of ideas that are like that, but I, that's the one that's sort of leading the pack at the moment. I'd like to do fantasy one day, but I I think uh, I think readers come to authors for like the thing they're already getting from them, yeah. right? And I'm like the science fantasy guy right now, and me jumping over to epic fantasy would sort of be like if your favorite metal band put out a jazz album. Yeah, know? yeah. As a multi genre guy, that is definitely a danger. You're going to lose some, and you're going to gain others. I think it's got to be a gradual thing. It's got to be natural, and you got to kind of like pivot slowly. Like I'll go from fantasy or urban fantasy to fantasy to his, historical fantasy to, and then the one my my least successful foray is into science fiction. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a bit further, right? It's it's the jazz album. Uh, I am hoping because I'm like right in the middle, right, with these sort of science fantasy books that it, maybe I could you know sort of flex either way. We'll see. Uh, well, and you've got some Sword and Planet experience too, because uh, you actually you were the editor for the Sword and Planet anthology, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we kind of cheated with that anthology a little bit. It kind of like it ran from like Dune to John Carter instead of being all John Carter. So you know, that's how I sort of snuck in there. But you know, like Dune's got a little John Carter in its DNA. You know, that's all right. So, all right. I think that's all the time we have for today. And, and I think this was a good primer and a good introduction to our listeners, to you, uh, to you, Chris, and to your writing and, and kind of your philosophy when you're tackling the writing. Um, now, we're going to have Chris on a couple more episodes. 
Um, the, the, good, the good thing about the way that Larry and I record all of our episodes is we sit down and we record like four in a row. And so that makes it so that when, when someone like Chris or whoever is in town, uh, we get them into the studio and we, we can record a few different topics. And so look forward to hearing more uh, from him uh, as he joins us on a couple more future episodes. So, yeah, so we, we appreciate all of you listeners out there. Um, and if you uh, look, if you, if you have any questions, if you if you have any other um, any things that you, you want to ask Chris, uh, feel free to shoot those questions in. We always we always listen to the questions that our supporters send uh, and we can forward them on to him. We can, you know, eventually once we once we figure out how tech how technology works, we can get them on the phone and you know, at a, at a future date and have him answer these questions for you. So anyway, we appreciate you all. Thank you all for listening. This is the Writer Dojo and we'll see you on the next one. Writer Dojo is Steve Diamond and Larry Correa. Produced by Jack Wilder and Bear and Hair Studios. Theme song, Word Mercenaries by Craig Nivo. New episodes come out every Wednesday wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can help support us by going to anchor.fm slash writer dojo, by leaving a five-star rating and review, and by helping to spread the word. To advertise on the Writer Dojo, email ads at writerdojo.com. All questions and comments can be emailed to questions at writerdojo.com. I got a I got a text from Larry once and he said, Hey, Steve, want to co-write this book with Bane? I said, sure. Well, lucky for you, I was lazy and, you know. <laughs> <laughs>